Good evening, I'm Toshi Okada. Time flies, it's already September 1st. Well, this is the first live stream on Nico Nico this month. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Let's see. Um, I ate too much lunch and I can't eat dinner. I see. I don't even know whether it's day or night. I've been sitting for 14 hours straight and writing outlines, so I've completely lost track of time. Anyway, mm, someone asked me, are you wearing an aloha shirt or suit today? Of course, uh, let me fix my color. Per usual, I'm wearing my aloha shirt. Basically, I'll wear suits again around November, but until then, I'd like to go with aloha. One more thing, I'll try my best to run things smoothly, but I think I'll be relatively long today. So at the end of the free broadcast, I'll let you take a bathroom break. Um, well, for those of you who use my limited service broadcast, the total amount of time will be quite long. So let's take a break for about five minutes. That's my plan for today. Okay, let's start from this week's Natsuzora, guys. What a mess. Last week was all about having a baby. And this week was about nursing that baby. Personally, I'm very disappointed. What's more, there were so many unreasonable plot lines. For example, Natsu is an animation supervisor for Kick Jaguar. This is kind of a mixture between Tiger Mask and Kick no Oni. Natsu is dissatisfied with the final episode of Kick Jaguar and intervenes with the story. Even though she's an animation supervisor and yet she makes comments on the story, is that possible? That's not her job. The role of animation supervisor, well, I guess saying this won't change anything, but for example, Mr. Yoshikazu Yasuhiko was an animation supervisor for Gundam, started commenting on the story after he experienced drawing his own manga and overseeing its production. If you have pride as an animation supervisor, you won't intervene with the storyline. If you want to make changes, first you need to establish rapport and engage in a dialogue with the current director or screenwriter. Otherwise, if Natsu suddenly pitches a new story and then everyone else just agrees and says, absolutely, great idea, that just sounds like a joke. And next week, the childhood friend Tenyo dies. The title said, goodbye Tenyo, so he'll definitely die. But there are only four weeks until the final episode. So why would you waste a whole episode on such a rubbish story? What's the point of killing Tenyo in the first place? They're killing Tenyo just to make the viewers cry. He's just dying in vain and it's a waste for people to cry over it. This is just like the time when Hayao Miyazaki accused Osama Tezuka for killing his characters to make his audience cry. Miyazaki said, I've lost respect for Tezuka ever since. Natsuzora is doing the same thing here. Someone just commented, don't expect too much from the morning soap opera. I understand that, but Mom Puku was quite serious about depicting the ramen and food industries. Masan took the whiskey industry seriously. But people don't take the animation industry seriously enough, and I'm not dissing the morning soap opera itself. People are just more meticulous if it's about industries other than animation. Some time ago, when an LDP member gave a speech in Akihabara, these otaku got very excited and became their supporters. That was a painful incident. Otaku like us are easily pleased when someone gives us special treatment. So people take advantage of us. I'm quite upset about that. Well, I'm sure the last two weeks of the season will contain all the tear-jerking moments with her lifelong separated sister. So they won't even have enough episodes for animation. I'm in despair. It's a matter of compatibility though. The writer is pretty good at writing family dramas and making the audience cry. But the depiction of animation as a profession is awful and the writer truly has no talent here. What if a famous family drama script writer, Sugako Hashida, was forced to write a script for Blue Blazes, a comic series about the animation industry? It just doesn't sound right. 
if things don't go well, Nan would only be a voice actor. But NHK would still be so proud that they pulled a former morning soap star into Natsuzora, as if they were doing her a service. Somehow I'm that pessimistic about the show. Last time I said if actor Nan were to make a cameo appearance in Natsuzora, she'd play the producer of space battleship Yamato, or be a voice actor on Sora from Tokachi, which was based on Heidi, a girl of the Alps. Anyway, I've already given up on this week's episode, I'm over it, because the childhood friend will die. May a miracle happen in the last three episodes. May a miracle happen is a famous line. A while ago, when Dragon Ball was filmed in Hollywood as a live-action film, manga artist Akira Toriyama saw the screening and was devastated. But he hoped for a miracle, and I feel the same way now. May a miracle happen, I sincerely hope so. Okay, now let's move on to Laputa Castle in the Sky. It's Laputa today. Well, I discussed the content and theme in the episodes on January 7th and 14th in 2018. So this time, I'd like to approach Laputa from a different perspective. This is the concept image of the slag ravine that appears in Laputa. This was drawn by Miyazaki early on in his career. What I want to talk about this time is the story of the slag ravine where Pazu was born and raised. What kind of place is the slag ravine? Laputa was originally planned by Miyazaki as a TV series long ago, so there are hours and weeks worth of episodes about this slag ravine. Ultimately, the ravine appears in the feature film Laputa, Castle in the Sky. There were actually a lot of ideas and episodes Miyazaki planned, but never came to fruition due to time constraints for the movie. I call these ideas Laputa's relics, and there are moments where these are early ideas pop up here and there in the feature film Laputa. So let's talk about Laputa's relics today. As an anime, Laputa is very easy for me to discuss because Isao Takahata, a former animation director of Ghibli, was the producer in addition to Laputa. Takahata produced Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. That means he really cracked the whip on Miyazaki. For example, when the complete picture of Laputa, the castle was unclear, Takahata convinced Miyazaki that the audience wouldn't understand the story, well, unless he showed the whole picture of the castle. So Laputa was well supervised by Takahata. After that, the two of them began to work on their own movies, My Neighbor Totoro and Grave of the Fireflies, which led to Miyazaki relinquishing his strict rules as a producer. Although Miyazaki was worried about Takahata's opinions, he could produce his movies more freely. So Nausicaa and Laputa are, let's say, their stories have a very strong backbone. That's why there's a lot to say about these works. There are many components to Laputa that were left out that we can easily find and discuss. This time, in order to explain about the Slag Ravine, I made a simple model of its terrain and features. Um, what kind of place is mine to the villagers? Why is the town scattered around the valley? Why does the town exist even at the bottom of a valley? Why is there a running train here? Why is Pazu's house on top of the valley? What's inside this huge hole? What is a mine? We can understand such various mysteries by creating this topographic map. To begin with, what's a slag? The story of Behind the Slag Ravine is the first Laputa relic I'll address today. On to part two. Here's a small model of Laputa. This castle in the sky is where the climax scene occurs. As you can see from this model, part of the castle has collapsed at the back. It's been destroyed and not in perfect form. 
By observing this collapsed part, some of you may imagine how Laputa used to be a magnificent castle in perfect form. The size of this Laputa, strangely, has been widely debated, but nothing is official. This is because there are a number of inconsistent depictions about the size in the movie, so an official figure couldn't be determined. But in today's episode, mm, uh, we'll investigate Laputa from different angles on screen. And, oops, I can't put this down properly. We've succeeded in determining the size of Laputa. We finally discovered that the size of Laputa in the movie is 1,760 meters in diameter. 1.7 kilometers, so it's about the same size as the Imperial Palace in the center of Tokyo or Osaka Castle. But even this huge Laputa is actually just the remains following a massive collapse. Originally, Laputa was already floating in the sky, ruling over everything on land 2,500 years ago. But that wasn't the same Laputa of today that collapsed. They're not the same. Mm, so how do I explain it? Mm, uh, how should I explain? When I say perfect form, mm, how do I explain it? It makes me want to use Dragon Ball as an example. Oh well, the perfect form of Laputa is 5.4 kilometers in diameter, 3.7 kilometers in height, which is almost the same size as Mount Fuji. Its width is almost equivalent to Mount Fuji, including the southern area called Mount Hoi. The Laputa in its perfect form is 100 meters higher than Mount Fuji. Let's see, just consider the difference in strength between the first Frieza in a wheelchair-looking thing and Frieza in perfect form, not the size. Maybe this isn't the best example. If the first one is the Slag Ravine, the second relic is Laputa itself, which existed in the sky 2,500 years ago. I'd like to create the perfect form of a giant Laputa in the sky. The third Laputa relic is Uncle Palm. Uncle Palm plays a really important role. Pazu and Shina meet this kind old man underneath the Slag Ravine. I think a lot of people aren't aware of the importance of this old man. For example, Uncle Palm appears for five minutes in a 124-minute movie. In terms of the length of speaking time, Uncle Palms is the longest after Pazu, Shita, and Captain Dola. In fact, Uncle Palm talks more than the villain, Colonel Muska. That's how important this character is. Uncle Palm only appears in scenes with Pazu and Shita with no one else. That's why Uncle Palm is the most important character that appears in the movie. Miyazaki had to cut down various lines and scenes in order to keep the movie length to 124 minutes. He cut out many scenes but still couldn't make Uncle Palm's appearance fall below 5 minutes. So, who is Uncle Palm? And what does his character symbolize? Now, here's the last scene Uncle Palm appears in. Uncle Palm is left in the dark hole. This is the hole he's left in. And here, Pazu is calling Shita. Come this way, into a world full of light. What did Miyazaki try to convey with this casual scene? In the third Laputa relic, I'd like to discuss Uncle Palm and investigate his puzzling character in depth. And today's urban legend, as you already know, I discuss slightly stranger, scary stories during each episode. And today's topic is a legendary floating empire. Laputa appears in Gulliver's Travels, which was written by Jonathan Swift in the 18th century. In the book, there is a country of dwarfs, Lilliput, and giants. Brobodingnang. Brobodingnang is quite hard to pronounce. The flying kingdom of Laputa also appears later. 
Back then, there were many discoveries of dwarfed races in Africa and Asia, as well as excavations of bones of giant beings. So Swift was greatly influenced by this news. In this way, Gulliver's Travels is a sort of political satire, and Swift wasn't writing a story that lacked an original source. So, what was the original story behind the floating empire Laputa? It's said to be based on a real-life incident. And what was the kingdom floating in the sky? I'd like to get into those details later. Here's an image from Gulliver's Travels. Laputa floats over a magnet. Beneath the small island of Laputa, there's a giant island called Balni Barbi, which is ruled by Laputa. At the end of Asia, the furthest east of Asia, lies Japan, in the eastern ocean of this mysterious country. Japan, there is a large island called Balnibari, and it's dominated by a 4.5 kilometer flying island Laputa. In fact, like I said earlier, there was an actual event that became the inspiration for the story of Laputa. At the beginning of the Middle Ages, before the 10th century, it was believed in France that there was a continent above the clouds where humans lived. People believed humans actually lived there, and there were many sightings. What's more, many records of trade exist. Just like that, I would like to introduce the story of a kingdom in the sky, which was said to have existed in history as this week's urban legend. After today's premium broadcast, I'm planning to screen Toshio Okada's Fantasy Theater. There are hints throughout Castle in the Sky that suggest a sequel, so I'd like to take some time to imagine what that would probably look like. Lastly, I'd like to discuss where the idea of Laputa was born. It was in a hidden cafe where Miyazaki drew ideas and stuff. You'll learn about this hidden cafe, so let me introduce it after my lecture. That's all for today's rundown. Let's start talking about Laputa. Are you ready? All right, let's get started. Do I need this? Yes, I do. I'll have to take a break from time to time because we have a long way to go today. Let's start with the Slag Ravine, the first Laputa relic. I'm using this image again. This is the Slag Ravine where the main character Pazu lives. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was left as a setting in Laputa. But you cannot tell what it is just by looking at it. There are many original ideas in Laputa, so let's take a look at them Buddha Tamori style, which means I'll stroll down to the Slag Ravine to seek this Laputa relic. First, what is slag? It is waste that is emitted when extracting metal from ore. When extracting metal, copious amounts of waste are produced. Take a look at this concept image. Can you see it? It says Tanju right here. It literally means mine house. So this is a residential area where coal miners live. There used to be residents for coal miners in the Mike coal mine, the Yubari coal mine, and even in the famous Gunkanjima. So coal mining houses are lined up here. Originally, the Slag Ravine was a coal mining town. A lot of slag, called spoil, is produced during the mining process. When you extract a cluster of coal and crack it open, there's actually only a tiny bit of coal and a hundred of times more of its spoils. So there's always a spoil tip near the coal mine, which is a pile built of accumulated slag. Uh, the great thing about Gunkanjima was that all the spoils were dumped into the sea, so there wasn't really a spoil tip. In the movie Radon, Giant Monster of the Sky, there are scenes of a larval monster climbing up a spoil tip. I thought the monster was climbing a mountain at first, but it wasn't. 
It was just accumulated mining spoils, so it's a man-made mountain of slag. Therefore, this deep valley of the slag ravine is not a natural valley. It's a man-made valley made of coal mining spoils or slag, and that's the original idea for the setting. That was supposed to be why it has such extreme terrain features. Oh, it's a little too chilly. Will you stop the fan? However, the mine where Pazu lives, which was originally planned to be a coal mine, was later changed into a mine for valuable materials, such as silver, copper, tin, etc. It was once a place where raw ore could be mined abundantly, but now not much is extracted, and all you see is mineral waste. So soon someone started calling the place the Mineral Waste Valley or the Slag Valley, and it eventually became known as the Slag Ravine. Now, let's take a look at the Slag Ravine again on the previous model. This model is quite sloppily made. How sloppy? You can see the newspaper from the back. I have to be extra careful with where I grab. For example, right here, it can easily become dented like this. So I can only use it for one broadcast. This is the overall shape of the slag ravine. Its actual depth is about twice the size of the model. So this model is not accurate around here. The depth is a bit off. You see towns here and there on the surface of the valley, but in the actual scene, this valley is twice as deep. And the towns located at the bottom of the valley are clustered together. Um, right at this location, there's a crossroad. This is the main street of the town, and this is the crossroad. At the beginning of the movie, there's a scene where Shida is attacked by pirates and falls out of the blimp. As she falls, you can see the tiny cross-shaped light next to her. Can you see it? This cross-shaped light changes in the next scene and becomes the crossroad in the slag ravine. Rather than falling into the crossroad, Shida falls straight into the slag ravine. You can tell by looking at the subtle cross-shaped light, the crossroad, and the shopping street Pazu runs through. Speaking of Pazu, let's look at this model again. This is the location of the crossroad. Here is Pazu's house. And here is the hole in the mine where Pazu brings stew to his boss. Pazu goes to work from his house and he was told to buy dinner. So he goes down the street to the shopping area at the crossroad. He buys some stew and then goes back up to the mine for work again. Like that. Let's see. Hmm. As I mentioned in the movie, the camera zooms in on the crossroad, then the scene switches to a shop that grills sausages or something. Then it shows Pazu buying stew in a store. Um, this is the area I mentioned earlier. I'd like you to notice that all the stores are open even though it's nighttime. It's not that Pazu goes to the store early in the night, it's actually pretty late at night. And that's because, as it applies to all over the world, people work 24 hours on a three-shift basis in the mine. Therefore, various stores in mining towns are always open for 24 hours. Whether it's a bookstore, a toy store, a restaurant, or a bar, a movie theater, a cabaret, or a coffee shop, Every store is open for 24 hours a day, so it's always a lively town like this. 
Pazu runs through this lively town, but if you look closely, there's someone sleeping. You might think this scene is atypical of Hayao Miyazaki style, but that's not the case here. Because this kind of thing never happens in a mining town with a good economy. For example, if you watch a film on Gunkanjima, stores there were open 24 hours a day. The monthly salary of college graduates at this time was roughly 3,000 yen to 5,000 yen. But coal miners were paid about 80,000 yen a month. So they wouldn't fall asleep in the street like this. Miners were very energetic, and if they saw someone pass down the street, they would carry that person to the next bar and treat them to a drink. This was when the mining economy was booming. The town of the Slag Ravine was once flourishing like this, and 24-hour stores were increasing. But we can see that's not the case in this scene. Pazu happens to witness the girl falling from the sky, and he runs for help. Pazu runs to rescue her. The girl is falling into the mine hole and Pazu screams, Whoa! What's going on? It may seem like he's running to the opposite side, but he's actually trying to go around to pass through this huge pulley and catcher. Now the hole in this mine is unusually large, maybe about 50 meters in diameter, and the bottom of this 50 meter wide hole where the depth is more than 50 meters deep, there's an elevator, a simple elevator, which descends about 800 meters. The speed of this elevator is close to free falling. You're floating in the air until you reach the bottom. If you see interviews of coal miners, they were so scared by the speed that they grasped the handrails until their hands turned white. Miners bore the fear and descended to the bottom. This huge pulley in the middle is the hoist for the elevator. Pazu was told by his boss to control it. When a bell rings, his boss says, Pazu, give it a try. Really? Just be careful. Just like that, the lever that Pazu is grasping controls the pulley, which is powered by a steam engine. It's roughly 800 meters deep and only takes about 10 or 20 seconds, so it's faster than a high speed elevator at Skytree. If you make an error with the timing of the brake, everyone will immediately die. Even in the records of the coal mine, at the time, it was common for people to die due to mistakes when operating an elevator, so Pazu is very nervous, since his boss has his hands full and he thinks Pazu can handle it. As soon as the miners come up in the elevator, they show a sample of their excavation to the geologist. This old man isn't a coal miner. Well, he's dressed like one, but he's looking at the ore with a magnifying glass, so he's a geologist. He's looking at the sample and sees a pattern between the stones, but he can't find silver or tin. Not even tin can be seen. That means the miners came up empty. So the boss feels really disappointed and he releases the steam from the kiln. When the boss pulls this lever, steam escapes from this kiln like whoosh. It might be hard to understand if you've never been involved with this kind of work. But when you remove the steam, the pressure of the kiln goes down instantly. At this point, a machine that runs on a steam engine will no longer work. It would take about an hour for steam to rise again in the kiln. In the novel version, Pazu wakes up early and sets a fire in the kiln. Then he cleans the floor until he's soaked with sweat. When he wrings his shirt, sweat falls like a waterfall. Only then does the temperature of the kiln finally start to rise. That's how precious and valuable steam is. 
It takes a lot of burning coal to store steam in a huge boiler, so everyone was hoping to find silver, copper, or at least tin from the new pit of the coal mine by working even through the night. The boss even has Pazu by dinner for the miners, but it turns out to be all for nothing. The boss gives up for the night and releases the steam from the kiln. This is a scene where you can see the boss's despair. He's bummed out. What is the steam from the steam engine used for? As you saw earlier, it's partially used to move the giant pulley and run the elevator. But this is just one function where it's more convenient to have steam than not. So what is the steam from the steam engine mainly used for? A steam engine isn't just for moving a train, nor moving a ship. The steam of the steam engine is meant to be used to manage the spring water that gushes from the bottom of mine tunnels. The deeper you get into the ground, the more water that needs to be brought out of the mine. It wasn't James Watt who invented the steam engine, but Thomas Newcomen. Newcomen invented the steam engine in order to drain the water out of mines. Working in a mine is a constant battle against pit water, so it was invented for the purpose of drawing water out of it. When the depth of a coal mine surpasses 15 meters, spring water becomes the biggest problem. The shallow part of the ground can be excavated in no time. But before the Industrial Revolution, the depth of coal mines exceeded 50 meters, reaching up to 100 meters. At that point, mm, let's see. Hmm. Well, in the beginning, miners removed water with their hands, like drawing water from a well. But their efforts weren't enough. Speaking of Newcomen, I thought he was a priest or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's put that aside. That's when the steam engine was invented. It was such a convenient invention for pumping spring waters from mines. So it quickly became popular in mines around the world. The steam engine and the elevator with a large pulley, as I showed earlier, have become something like symbols of coal mines all over Europe. Well, when all these facilities were installed, in other words, this huge pulley elevator and steam engine, this marked the golden age of the slag ravine. I think it was during this era that light railways were constructed in the valley. All right. Oh, this is a little far away. This is a model of a light railway running in the Slag Ravine. But actually, I don't think this is accurate. It shouldn't be wooden, but was altered by Hayao Miyazaki in order to make the visuals more exciting. This movie is set to take place in Wales, but back then there weren't enough trees to build bridges like this. Most of the trees were cut down or burned down at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and there was only iron left in the United Kingdom. So was it called Industrial Heritage? The United Kingdom built the Iron Bridge and it became the world's first industrial heritage. The thing is, there wasn't any high-quality timber left in the UK, so they had no choice but to make iron bridges. But Miyazaki exercised his artistic license and drew the light railway on a wooden bridge to make it look cool. Uh, in the Slag Ravine, this light railway is laid everywhere. And like this diagram, these cardboard railways mimic the light railway. Right here is the station, and the light railway is running in all directions. How freely does it run? Let's see. 
When you see the storyboard of the Slag Ravine, I mean, not a storyboard, but an artboard, an artboard is a stage before background artists draw the background scenery. Before a team of background artists draws the scenery, an art director draws the base image, and that's called an artboard. Based on the artboard, each background artist adjusts the picture. For example, it's daytime, so I'll add sunlight. Or I'll add morning haze since it's early morning. That's how animation backgrounds are based on artboards. As you can see, this light railway is running almost everywhere. This is because the Slag Ravine isn't just a mining town. In addition to mining, they also handle all manufacturing operations, from smelting ore to processing it. That's why the railway runs throughout the entire town. There are steel cable facilities and workshops everywhere. So, the town is surrounded by chimneys and railway tracks. It's an incredible structure made up of railway tracks. Well, the author of Keep Your Hands Off Eizoken would love the structure here. This slag ravine is actually a bit strange, can you tell? There is something missing. Do you see it? There should be something here in a large factory town like this. But we don't see it. For example, in the famous scene where Pazu blows the trumpet at dawn in the Slag Ravine, his house has the best view of the Slag Ravine. As he plays the trumpet on top of the valley, the sun shines down onto the cliff of the Slag Ravine. It's quite a beautiful scene. But why does Pazu live in a place like this? Something should have been on top of this cliff originally. In order to figure out what's missing, we need to watch a TV animation that Hayao Miyazaki produced two years prior to releasing Laputa. That is, Sherlock Hound. In episode 11 titled The Sovereign Gold Coins, there is a valley just like the Slag Ravine. It's called Gilmore Valley. When Holmes and Watson ascend the hill in an automobile, they're surprised that they see huge chimneys lined up and smoke billowing out at the bottom of the Gilmore Valley. It's an industrial town where a lot of poor people live. <laughs> this is the image source for the Slag Ravine. They look so much alike. However, something was intentionally removed from the Slag Ravine. Let me show you. Here you go. This is it. It's Gilmore's mansion. As the camera pans from the bottom of the valley, you see a poor neighborhood. And on the top of the valley lives a wealthy man named Mr. Gilmore, who owns Gilmore Valley. He has a splendid mansion, and we see a scene where his golden piggy bank is shining brightly. Mr. Gilmore owns the valley and the mansion. Whether it's a coal mine or another type of mine, these all require large funds for maintenance and development. That's why Gilmore's shiny mansion overlooks the valley. However, there is no mansion at the top of the Slag Ravine. As you saw earlier, there's no mansion at all. There are only factories all the way up. That's why Pazu lives in a prime location, like the top of a hill. This isn't because Hayao Miyazaki didn't remember or didn't care. Only two years prior to Laputa, Miyazaki produced Sherlock Hound. And there he drew a mansion owned by a rich man on top of the valley. The reason he didn't draw the mansion in Laputa is because all the riches were gone 30 years later and the Slag Ravine's economy continued to collapse. The Slag Ravine resides in a world roughly 30 years after that of Gilmore Valley. The major investors have left and the town has become shabby. 
There may have once been facilities such as a church or community hall where Pazu lives. But since the water is no longer running, life there became inconvenient, rendering it in uninhabitable. So only Pazu lives there. I think it's that kind of place. Speaking of the world 30 years later, what kind of place has the poverty-stricken Slag Ravine become? This is the boss's wife. This is when the wife yells, Run quickly! She's quite well endowed and she has large shoulders and a good physique too. Actually, Hayao Miyazaki explained in his art book called Art of Laputa that this wife is 20 years old. Someone also just commented, she's only 20 years old. That's right, she got married at the age of 15 and already has children. That's pretty young, right? The boss married a 20-year-old, or more precisely, a 15-year-old, and had kids with her. The reason is that second and third generation minors marry and have a family at a younger age. This phenomenon occurs in mine towns which have flourishing economic activity. In the past, the economy was good. So young guys married early and became independent quickly because their salary was 10 or 20 times that of working elsewhere. That's why they didn't need to live at home anymore. Not only the eldest son, but the second son or the third son can work really hard and earn a lot of money so they could marry and build their own houses. That's why there are a lot of houses in the Slag Ravine. It was still common practice to marry a young bride, since this custom from the economic boom period was passed down. Almost no one worked as a professional miner in Japan, the UK, or anywhere else. Those who worked as miners were originally penniless, which is why they started working in mines. Once they started working in the mines, they earned more money than expected and ended up settling down in mine towns. Miners are generous. When they earn money, they spend it right away on leisure. So the number of bars and other forms of entertainment grew. As I mentioned earlier, it's only natural for young men to gain financial independence and marry a 15-year-old girl. However, while the Slag Ravine is a remnant of customs from such an era, the economic situation has been worsening. One reason is that the underground ore that's easy to dig has been completely excavated. So someone may have to dig about 800 meters and two or three or perhaps even five and ten kilometers to the side in order to find ore. Even more serious problems are hidden in this model. This terrain model and the mining railway model, why is the Slag Ravine's economy deteriorating so rapidly? That's because of this cute and lovely light railway. Well, the railway that runs vertically and horizontally in this Slag Ravine, this well-made railway has shortened the economic lifespan of the town. It's a historical fact, but in the middle of the 19th century, there were a lot of mines in the mountains, just like the Slag Ravine. There used to be mines for other materials, but most of them also suddenly became ghost towns in the middle of the 19th century. So this tragedy isn't unique to the Slag Ravine. It wasn't just because miners could no longer get any coal or ore. Mining towns in the mountains quickly fell into ruin. This didn't just happen in the UK, but in the US as well. Old American industrial cities were often in the mountains or the middle of the continent. Most of them became deserted, while cities like Pittsburgh and Detroit grew. Um, steel City, Pittsburgh, which is known for its steel industry, is located next to the Ohio River. Detroit is sandwiched between two lakes, Lake Erie and Lake Huron. As the Industrial Revolution progressed in the 19th century, somehow machines became heavy and gigantic. Machines got larger and the things made with the machines got larger too. Therefore, an immense amount of coal had to be burned. 
So cities with only land transportation, such as trains, became more expensive. The industrial zone began to move to cities facing rivers, seas, and lakes, where waterways and water transport were possible. Of course, a large amount of water was necessary to make industrial products. But the question of transportation was even more important. I went to Detroit this March and visited the Henry Ford Museum. I was given a tour and was really surprised because I only knew of Detroit as a motor city. But before it became a motor city, there were preparations. The city of Detroit was rapidly expanding in the mid-18th century, which is around the time when the Slag Ravine started falling into ruin. Uh, the museum guide told me that Detroit developed because it happened to be near a lake back then. Detroit was mainly making bicycles and carriages. As technology developed, products became heavier and the weight became too heavy to transport. Eventually, railways and carriages were replaced by ships, as this form of transportation was the most cost-effective. That's how the city of Detroit survived. And as a result, the automobile was invented and Detroit became a motor city. But it was with the benefit of hindsight, and it really was thanks to water transportation. I was pretty surprised to hear that. So the question is, how many freight trains could this light rail pull? Disregarding speed, if it's on the water, you can connect the freight to a tugboat. But on the railways, even locomotives have limits to the number of wagons they can pull, even at maximum strength. That's why industrial towns in the mountains have become cost-intensive. Rather than a limited supply of ore being the problem, the transportation costs, relative to the amount of ore, was disproportionately high leaving a town, unable to compete with other cities. Eventually, these towns became ghost towns. The Slag Ravine became unprofitable, simply because the transportation costs rendered the metals profitless. I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm reading a social studies textbook. But in anime, since Miyazaki covers such detail, it becomes interesting. Back then, when Miyazaki was drawing Sherlock Hound, there weren't many automobiles, so rich people who lived around mines didn't care about water transportation. Their attitude was more or less, I make the rules here because I own this town. However, in the era of water transportation, as the Gilmore Valley and the Slag Ravine are really deep in the mountains, those towns quickly became deserted. The towns slowly become desolate and poor, so the owners like Mr. Gilmore of the Gilmore Valley disappeared from them. Gilmore named the valley after himself, the Gilmore Valley. So the Slag Ravine's owner probably named it after their family too. But they sold the mining rights to a bank or something. And then they moved to a new industrial and commercial city, somewhere like London, Paris, or New York. Later, these people became conglomerates like the Rockefeller family and Rothschild family. While owners like Gilmore were domineering and made everyone work like slaves, they also felt strongly attached to the mines they owned. So, mine ownership under such wealthy families actually lasted for a long time. Even though efficiency was decreasing, families tried hard to keep running and developing the family business. As a result, there are many mines in the world that managed to survive. However, banks are different. Unlike family owners, banks don't have an emotional attachment to mines. So if a mine can't make a profit, they will stop operating in the blink of an eye. At the beginning of the novel version of Laputa, the boss goes to a city that's half a day away. The owner of the mine goes to the neighboring city to visit the bank in order to negotiate. But this negotiation scene wasn't used in the film. Instead, the story begins with the discovery of a bone demon somewhere in the countryside, and it turns out to be a robot soldier that had fallen from Laputa. 
What an impressive opening to the story. The boss talks about a mysterious robot falling from the sky. He also talks about how devastating it is that the bank owning the mine will likely shut it down, even after he walked for half a day in order to speak with them. But the boss still tries to entertain Pazu with the mysterious incident of the robot. I think these stories are intertwined in an amazing way. This is another Laputa relic, but the scene was completely cut from the movie. Since this bank is the owner of the mine, and it's located in the city, the Slag Ravine has no autonomy. If this were Gilmore Valley, Mr. Gilmore would be very controlling. That also sounds problematic. But the bank has already given autonomy to the people of the Slag Ravine, allowing them to do whatever they want as long as they generate money. So it's up to the boss and miners to decide which direction they want to dig, and also when to call it a day or try harder and work overtime. In other words, it depends on the boss's mood. He has to decide when to work and when to rest. Only this kind of autonomy remains. People in the Slag Ravine tend to treat outsiders coldly, and they're very confident in themselves, and aren't afraid of authority. I think such a masculine culture comes from the time when the, even though the Slag Ravine gradually fell into poverty, the miners kept their autonomy while negotiating with the banks and kept mining. Well, the bank would likely say they'd abandon or close the mountain if the mine can't make a profit. That's why wealthy people don't live in the Slag Ravine, the first Laputa relic. It's no longer a profitable place. This background wasn't drawn in the movie version of Laputa. But if you look closely, there are men squatting in the corner, or miners confidently confronting air pirates. The remnants of this Laputa relic, which I've discussed in Buratamori style. There's another secret regarding the Slag Ravine that I'd like to talk about in today's premium broadcast, or perhaps after my lecture. All right. Moving on to the next topic. I'll see you later, Light Railway. And the terrain model. Wow, it's already been an hour. I'm far from done, sorry. Now, on to the second Laputa relic. I would like to truly depict the aerial empire Laputa from 2500 years ago. It was 700 years ago in the movie Colonel Muska told Shita that Laputa was abandoned 700 years ago. So Shita's and Muska's ancestors abandoned Laputa and began dwelling on the ground. Since then, an uninhabited Laputa has been wandering in the clouds unnoticed. So what kind of city is Laputa? I'm going to explain it again in Buddha Tamori style. I repeated myself, hey, okay, let's leave this here for a moment. This is a model of Laputa, the aerial kingdom, that was destroyed 700 years ago. The size of this Laputa has not really been addressed anywhere. There are plenty of verification websites, because Ghibli-related work receives high traffic, but very few people describe the size of Laputa. But, thankfully, there's an easy-to-understand scene in the movie. This is that scene. It's a bit dark and hard to see, but this is the air destroyer Goliath. It's the latest airship owned by the military, and this is a scene where Goliath was docked next to Laputa. It's said to be 312 meters long, so if you look here, Laputa's diameter seems like it's approximately 500 meters. But if that's the size of Laputa, there seems to be an inconsistency, right? The inconsistency occurs when Shita and Pazu land on Laputa, say, Oh, there's a pond. Look inside and go, Whoa! 
They're surprised that it actually isn't a pond. This is what it looks like from above. Shita and Pazu look very small from up here. When they look down from the narrow gap of what looks like a pond, there's an ancient stone city submerged in the water. You see some mysterious deep sea fish swimming through it. It's a magnificent panoramic landscape. This large group of buildings is submerged in the water, but the depth seems to exceed 100 meters. Those buildings endlessly go down to the bottom. That means if the diameter of Laputa is 500 meters, then this pond-like place can't possibly fit in Laputa. There's no way an underwater city more than 100 meters deep would fit. That's just impossible. Then why is such a scene... Uh, oops, wrong picture. Why is Goliath featured in the scene? It's simple. Goliath is intentionally drawn large here. It wouldn't be scary if Goliath was depicted small. Goliath has been docked next to Laputa in order to highlight a sense of urgency and despair because the military has arrived. The size of Goliath is exaggerated in this scene. Actually, this model of Laputa is a paper toy. It's made from layered paper that is then precision laser cut. I happened to talk to the person in charge of producing this paper toy at a company called Sanke Art. It was a lucky coincidence. In Nihonbashi, Osaka, there is a huge otaku town, which I believe is the second biggest after Akihabara. In the center of that city, there's a building called Joshin Super Kids Land. It's about six stories high, and every floor is filled with toys and models. It's like the wonderland of your dreams. There are various toy stores all over Japan, but I think the most exciting store in Japan is probably Joshin Super Kids Land. So, when I went there, I saw a lot of accurately detailed models produced by Sanke Art there. I was amazed and then was like, whoa, 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 then I noticed that differently assembled times were written on those models. This Laputa model said 7 hours. That light railway over here was about 7 to 8 hours. Larger models take more time. For example, Kiki's and Gigi's house from Kiki's delivery service takes 13 to 17 hours. The bathhouse model from Spirited Away takes 170 hours. I felt dizzy. I mean 170 hours, but the thing is Spirited Away, models include not only the bathhouse, but also the clock tower, and pretty much the whole town can be turned into a paper toy. Most of them take 23 to 40 hours, and I was shocked. Then a man said he was in charge of these products, so I asked him whether it takes so long because the toys are made by amateurs, not professionals. Then he answered, no, professionals will require 170 hours. I was completely mind blown. Why does it take so much time and effort? Well, Sanke Art wasn't originally a toy maker. It was a company for architectural models. Later, the company became interested in Ghibli's architecture and made a proposal to Ghibli for permission to reproduce precise replicas of architecture from the movies. But Ghibli's response was, Hayao Miyazaki makes up the measurements, so you'll have a hard time. Then Sanke Art said, that's only normal when you create a set for films, and we can talk it over. Just like that, Sanke Art received the details from Ghibli and they submitted questions regarding any inconsistencies. That's how these models are made. So these models are pretty accurate. There are some inconsistencies, but the company made it as realistic as possible. What I'm trying to say is that this reduced to scale model is quite accurate. For example, if you look at this Laputa from above, you can see that the glass dome located in the middle of the puta isn't completely centered. It's quite off-center. This kind of thing can't be known unless you create a model. Do you see a small green circle here? This small round part is the basis for calculating the size of Laputa. And it's the basis for everything in creating this model. But what is this round part? It's the terrace where Pazu and Shida land with a kite.
So now I'd like to explain Laputa size with Buddha Tomori style. Let's measure it together. Um, this scene is the basis of everything. As you can see, I've already written down some numbers here and there. I want you to take a look at the kite's wing. It's bent but not broken. At the end of the movie, when Pazu and Shida ride the kite, Pazu says, it can fly if I rewire it. This means the wing isn't broken. So if we know the size of the kite, we can determine the diameter of this terrace. So how big is this kite? Let, let's take a closer look. This is the scene that shows the kite size clearly. This is a scene where Henry, the third son of the Dola family, is sitting in the tiger moth. When Henry is sitting there, Pazu climbs up the ladder. Later, Shida joins Pazu in a cockpit too. The size of this cockpit allows two children to fit if sitting tightly together. Therefore, assume its width is approximately 100 centimeters, which is about one meter. Henry was small for a member of the Dola family, and he can fit in the cockpit. So it's probably 100 centimeters or one meter wide. When you know the size of the cockpit and look at this scene, where the kite's wing is spread open, we can determine the size based on the ratio of the wing to the kite. In order to fly a kite with two passengers and no power, it is certainly necessary to have a wingspan of about 12 meters or more. The kite needs a surface area of approximately this. We can rely on Miyazaki indeed. The wingspan is 12 meters long. It's quite large. It's almost the same size as a former Japanese Navy Zero fighter. At first I thought the wingspan is probably 7 or 8 meters long, but considering it's flying two passengers and Pazu has to take Shida back to Gondor, that might be too small. So, 12 meters is a good size. It's impressive that the kite can fly with only wires securing it. Now that we know the length of the wingspan, we can roughly estimate the terrace size and size of the kite with a slightly bent wing after the crash. It's after the crash, so I'd like to assume the wingspan is about 8 meters wide, and the diameter of the terrace about 30 meters. Now we can determine the entire size of Laputa. If the terrace... I'm sorry, are you guys still interested? I'm having a blast. If the terrace is 30 meters in diameter, the bridge that connects the terrace to the mainland is probably 44 meters. Surprisingly, it's just slightly longer than the terrace. Now we know the bridge is 44 meters. Next, there's a scene where you can see the whole of Laputa. So if this length is 44 meters right here, the radius from the center of Laputa to the terrace is about 335 meters. If we know the radius, we can determine the whole size. We already know that the radius here is about 335 meters. So the radius to the corridor, which is the outermost section, is 20 times larger than the terrace bridge. That means the radius of Laputa is 880 meters and its diameter is 1760 meters. It turned out to be a 1.7 kilometer diameter structure. It's larger than I thought. Well, how big would it be if Laputa appeared over Tokyo? Here's the Imperial Palace. Uh, how dare you, you might think. But if Laputa appears right above it saying, Japanese, surrender, Laputa could cover the whole Imperial Palace. It's huge. So it's about the size of the Imperial Palace. I even thought it was intentional. This time let's float Laputa above Osaka Castle. This is the map. As you can see, Laputa is almost the same size as the central area of the Osaka Castle. 
If you think about building a large castle just like the Imperial Palace, a realistic large castle would be around 1.7 kilometers in diameter, which is about the size of Laputa. It might be hard to imagine, and it's hard to explain too. This time I'll float Laputa over Shinjuku. If Laputa appeared over Alta in Shinjuku, the north side of Laputa would cover Okubo or Shinokubo area. Then the west side would cover the Metropolitan Government Office. The south side would cover beyond Yoyogi and half of Shinjuku Gyoen National Garden. The east side would cover Hanazono Dori Street, where Yoshimoto Kogyo's headquarters are. It even covers Shinjuku Shanchome area as well. That's how enormous Laputa is. Now you can see how big Laputa is. But this Laputa isn't the original size. Like I said earlier, the back of Laputa is collapsed. But even if we fix the back side, it wouldn't be the same Laputa. The actual Laputa was way bigger. The thing is, Pazu and Shita walk around Laputa, but this Laputa doesn't seem to have any homes where the dwellers would live. There are gardens, trees, and graves, but that's all they see. The reason is that the top part of Laputa is actually a temple. So it's a place to worship God. Let's see what could be a good example. Well, imagine the Acropolis. Just like the Acropolis in Greece, a temple lies on top of Laputa. The first layer of Laputa, which is below the temple, the green area with lawn is a space of relaxation, exclusively for the members of royalty who lived in the space. If that's the case, Laputa would only belong to them. Then, what exactly was the actual Laputa originally like? 700 years ago, when Shita's ancestors abandoned Laputa, even though it had already been downsized to this, underneath it was a second lair, a castle town where knights and warriors lived. In the third lair, the Garden of Eden, there was a huge lake and farmland, allowing people to be self-sufficient. The fourth lair, where Laputa's local people lived, had a huge structure that ordinary Laputa residents could visit as well. But these three layers have already disappeared. So how big was the original Laputa? This is what Laputa looked like originally. This picture was enlarged to almost the same size as the Laputa model. So this temple in the area where the royal family lived was at the top of the picture like this. Here to here is 1.7 kilometers. And in addition to that, this huge part was attached to the original Laputa. Okay. Okay, okay. Now let's see. So the size of the remaining Laputa is, as I mentioned earlier, 1,760 meters in diameter, 1.7 kilometers. Then what is the original size of Laputa from here to here? Relatively speaking, the original was 5.8 kilometers in diameter and 3.7 kilometers in height. That's about the same size as Mount Fuji. So let's examine this magnificent world of Laputa from a geological perspective during the second part. Well, it's already been over an hour, but I still have more things to cover, so we'll continue the free broadcast for a little longer. Sorry about that. I've featured Laputa twice, so I thought I didn't have much left to talk about and decided to focus on a geological perspective today. But I was wrong. I'll move on to the last topic and then take a break, so hang in there. <laughs> Now I'd like to talk about the urban legend of Laputa. All right. So there's a very famous urban legend about a phantom ending. Well, here it is. Some say they saw it in the theater or on the Friday road show. But this puzzle has already been solved. 
This is an image that Miyazaki drew in his early days that describes Pazu flying in his ornithopter, an aircraft that flies by flapping its wings to go pick up Shita and hang out with her. So this image that Miyazaki drew fooled everyone and triggered everything. People who saw this image somehow connected it to their memories and others saw it in the staff credits after Laputa aired on Friday Road Show. Because of this image and other images in the credits, rumors started about an additional ending to Laputa. Human beings are interesting in the way we create new memories in our heads based on what we see and believe. That's why some people say that there was another version of the ending in the movie. Actually, this is only mysterious urban legend featuring Laputa as far as I know. But there are other urban legends regarding the aerial empire. As I mentioned in the agenda earlier, I'd like to feature them today. Like I said earlier, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels from the 18th century features Lilliput, a country of dwarves and Brobdingnag, where giants live, and the floating kingdom Laputa in the story. So what was the inspiration for a kingdom floating in the air? Well, Jonathan Swift wasn't the type of person who wrote stories that were completely fictional. His stories were based on real-life models. So what did he use to write an aerial empire? Allow me to explain. Have you ever heard of Magonia? Magonia is an air kingdom, believed to have existed in France around the 9th century. It was well documented throughout France that there was land above the clouds and people from there sailed down to the ground and brought back grains and fruits. You can find out more details on Wikipedia. Check out Magaonia. The Archbishop of Lyon named Agobard, who was a noble Christian and therefore unlikely to lie, officially recorded that he caught four merchants getting off a boat from Magonia and sentenced them to death by stoning. People killed the merchants by throwing stones at them. Magonia isn't a myth only in France. Back in 956, in the county Clare in Ireland, an archbishop recorded that a flying sailboat had descended, and this was preserved as an official record. The sailboat came down from the sky and tried to dock in the church, but as it was anchoring, the chain got caught in the church's arch, so the ship couldn't escape. Then a man came down from the flying ship to remove the anchor. But the people in the County Clare saw everything. They got excited and tried to capture the man, but the Archbishop told the citizens to let go of him. Then the man hurriedly returned to the sailing ship, cut the chain himself, and the boat sailed away to the sky. This was also official record. It sounds a little suspicious, but if it were really were dubious, there would be many other lies left by the Archbishop. What I'm trying to say here is, what the Archbishops wrote in the medieval records at the time were recognized as quite accurate. If this is just gossip or a lie, it would be natural for many other unbelievable stories to have been written by the Archbishops. But there are no such stories. For some reason, such stories are left behind from medieval France and Britain. Flying sailboats were sighted in the county of Kent. England from as early as 1211 and even in 1743, the 18th century in Wales. It seems that a flying sailboat in Wales descended quite low, and people could even see the keel at the bottom of the ship sticking out from between the clouds. These ships were said to have come from Magonia, a floating island in the sky. Legend has it Magonia is inhabited by the Tempestari from which the word tempest originates. The tempestari are weather-making magicians who cause lightning and storms. So the reason why the Laputa of Laputa Castle in the Sky 
is protected by storms and thunder is because Miyazaki knew about Magonia and Tempestari. He'd say, everyone, as you know, Laputa is based on Swift's Gulliver's Travels, which was written based on, yep, you've guessed it, Magonia. As if we all had any idea. Miyazaki tends to show off his intelligence without fear. But of course, we have no idea what he's talking about. That's just how he is. So, what were the records of the Archbishop of Lyon and the Bishops of Ireland and Wales about? If they were all hallucinations, why were there so many witnesses, and why did they bother making official records? Anyway, that's the reason why I believe Magonia was more than just a rumor. However, suddenly there were no more new eyewitness testimonies of Magonia from the 19th century and on. This is a record from 1655. A major battle between flying sailboats was recorded that year. An account of those who witnessed the fight between the flying sailboats was published in 1680. Perhaps this aerial empire Magonia really existed, but in the middle of the 17th century, a war broke out between them, and they may have been completely annihilated by such a war. From deep in the mountains, or the jungle, or from the bottom of the sea, where no boats could have passed, sometimes gold coins or ornaments made of metal have been found. These kinds of mysterious objects are frequently discovered. So far, no one knows the truth behind these mysteries, but perhaps the Magonia that terrified Europeans from the 9th to 12th centuries was later destroyed in an aerial war in the 17th century. And maybe these coins and ornaments are Magonia's cultural legacy. That's all for today's free broadcast. Thank you for listening to my rambling. <laughs> okay, now please submit the questionnaire for today's broadcast. Well, well, this was a strange story. I mean, whether it was a hallucination or UFO, there are only two answers. But there's also an inconsistency. I guess it's up to you whether you believe it or not. Okay, let's check out the questionnaire results. Oh, thank you. Oh, the premium will be even better. Thank you. Well, in the latter half of the premium broadcast, I'd like to discuss the biggest mystery of Laputa. Like I mentioned a little earlier, who exactly is Uncle Palm? It's a bit of a painful and sad story, though. Then let's stroll around the magnificent world of Laputa. I'll talk more in details using more images since there are many more cultural heritage of Laputa. So let's look at them. Now let's take a five minute restroom break. After the break, we'll move on to the premium broadcast. Okay, our five minute break starts now. Whew! Let's keep the camera rolling during this five minute break for free. I'm not working though. I thought about reading letters from the viewers, but I was too busy writing outlines, so I didn't have time to look at them. <laughs> I guess I can just organize the boards for the premium broadcast now. I used to get up and make coffee during the break. Well, there's a kitchen back there, behind the camera. You can't really see it, but there's a staff member sitting at a table over there with a laptop. It's like a little digital booth over there. So I, I gave up making coffee and instead I drink water now. That's a little story about why I drink water every week. Alright, I'll just organize these boards for now, though it might be meaningless. I don't need this anymore, so I'll remove it. I don't need this map either. Hmm. It was really fun. I had a blast when I was investigating the size of Laputa. 
It was so fun. I printed it out and measured it with a ruler, expanded it, and did it again from different perspectives, over and over. It was really fun. It made me realize I have a plain and dark personality. Okay, I have all the boards I need. Maybe I'll use this big one again. How about this one? Oh, I don't need this one anymore. They were for measurements. Oh, we still have two more minutes. I don't need this big thing. Uh, these were for Sherlock Hound, so I don't need them anymore. Oh, I found the board I was looking for earlier. Should I still use it? Nah, forget it. All right, shall we go start the premium broadcast? But first, next week's preview. I'd like to pick up from where we left off with Ponyo. Last time, I mostly talked about how terrifying Ponyo's mother, Grand Mamade, is. I'd also like to read letters from the viewers. So please submit one if you have any comments or questions by, let's say, next Friday. That's September 6th. So if you can submit by next Friday, I'll put them in my outlines. I want to talk about my trip to the US as well. For the premium broadcast, I'm giving out presents to the viewers, so you'll find out if you won during the broadcast. Okay, we're moving on to the later half now. Thank you for watching.